Once the dinosaurs went extinct in the fiery blaze of the K-Pig impact, their avian cousins and descendants survived and thrived, with many becoming large predatory animals that specialized in holding down and tearing apart reptiles, birds, and mammals alike. One of the most iconic groups of these extinct birds of prey are the terror birds. One important aspect to their biology has just been confirmed thanks to a fossil trackway from Argentina. In the 66 million years since the non-avian dinosaurs died out, the avian ones have taken on new and diverse ecological roles. That's obviously being vague in general, since they went on to become some of the smallest, fastest, and most bizarre vertebrates, becoming masters of the ground, sea, and air. But I digress. One of the most disconcerting groups of ancient birds that we never got to meet were the terror birds, the Furosrocoidea, or just the Furosrocids, depending on your preference. The terror birds were large carnivorous flightless birds that occupied the niche of top predator in many South American and some North American ecosystems from the Eocene Epoch at around 53 million years ago to about 100,000 years ago in the late Pleistocene. One of the pillars for the hypothesis of a predatory mode of life for forest rockets is based on the traits of their hind limbs, which seem to be suitable for pursuing prey. Comparison of the hind limb of forest rockets with those of living groups suggests that the terror bird groups Mesembryornithinae and Patagornithinae were likely ground-dwelling running birds, but members of the Siloptorinae were likely walkers and waders. The exact way in which these predators dispatch their prey has remained a minor debate among experts for years. Obviously, they would have most likely pinned their prey down with their feet as they tore it apart with their beaks. There aren't a ton of other options for an armless predator, however there is still some wiggle room for adaptation. Did they stab their prey to death with their talons first? Were their talons only used for pinning and gripping? Did they kick their prey with their talons or simply run them down and bash them to death with their recurved beaks? There are plenty of resources out there dealing with the biomechanics and morphology of the critters, but little about how they held their feet, their primary or secondary weapon. A study was published in September of 2023 in Scientific Reports by Ricardo Melchor, Silverio, Feola, M. Cristina Cardonata, Nahuel Espinoza, Manuel A. Rojas Manuiques, and Lorena Horaso, describing the first known set of fossil footprints from terror birds in South America, and they reveal something particularly interesting about their feet. The fossil footprints were discovered at the Pozo Salado locality in the Rio Negro province of Argentina. The footprints themselves were found eroding out of the Rio Negro formation, which is at least 30 meters thick in the area and includes dune and associated lake deposits. The terror bird tracks were not alone. They were found in the lowermost part of the local Rio Negro formation, in particular on top of an interval composed of thin bedded sandstone, interbedded with thin reddish mudstone showing wave ripples and occasional mud cracks. These wave ripple crests are associated with small shorebird-like footprints. The two overlying beds are thicker and composed of parallel laminated well-sorted sandstone and interbedded mudstone beds. The top of these beds contains fossil footprints attributed to ground sloths, rheas, and the bizarre South American endemic macrocheneids. The uppermost mudstone interval contains bivalve locomotion trace fossils and is capped by a sandstone bed with concretions made in soils with lots of plant roots. This lowermost interval containing the forest rocket footprints is interpreted as a shallow lake setting, with development of wet to moist mudflats that were the adequate medium for registration and preservation of footprints. The lake mudflats were flooded and exposed repeatedly, with the subsequent deposition of mud and production of subaqueous bivalve locomotion trace fossils and alternating periods of exposure, desiccation, and eventual rooting by plants. Your average watering hole area, not entirely dissimilar to White Sands National Park besides the, you know, sands. The new trackway is composed of 11 consecutive footprints and a few missing or shoddy prints of what is called a functionally didactyl locomotion style. This means the footprints seem to show a bird-like animal walking primarily on two toes, but with enough impressions made that it also had a third toe. This obviously falls into the category of ichnology, the study of trace fossils. 
Ichnology gives two scientific names to footprints just as botany, zoology, and paleontology does. It's for bookkeeping mostly. The author team decided to name these tracks Rio Negrina Pozosaladensis. Apologies to the authors, no offense meant, but this name is pretty rubbish because it says nothing of who made the tracks and only of where they were found. In my personal and biased opinion, forest sickness would ring better for the very first forest racket footprints ever found, but what do I know? So who precisely made these footprints? The overall anatomy of the footprints, bipedal configuration of the trackway, and the age of the hosting rocks suggests that the potential producer should be a large bird that inhabited Patagonia in the late Miocene. The average body mass of the bird is estimated at about 55 kilograms, using an allometric equation related to the area of the footprints of birds and reptiles. This body mass is likely to be underestimated, as the database used for calculation lacks information on birds larger than 22 kilograms. Potential candidates for the Miocene fauna of South America are Caryamids, Rheids, and Forest Rackids. The Caryamidae is represented since the early Miocene by small-bodied specimens, with a size similar to modern Sarimas. Modern Sarima footprints are roughly similar to Rio Negrina in the overall configuration, including reduction of the second toe, although are considerably smaller. Miocene rheids have a three-toed foot and are mostly smaller than the living rhea, especially the fossil species of rhea, although Opisthodactylus is slightly larger. Opisthodactylus kirshneri is considered about 10% larger than rhea americana and of similar size to Opisthodactylus patagonicus. Fossil rayid footprints occur in the Rio Negro formation and were also recorded in other neogene and quaternary units from Argentina. Fossil rayid footprints are tridactyl with a maximum length of about 170 mm and were mostly assigned to the Ichnogenus Arameoichnus rhea. Miocene rayid footprints are similar in anatomy and size to modern rhea footprints. Geometric morphometric comparison of Rio Negrina Pozosaladensis Arameoichnus rhea and footprints of living Rhea Americana, Rhea Panata, and Chunga Burmeisteri suggest that the producer of Rio Negrina Pozosaladensis is not related to the Caryamids or Rheids, therefore, must be a forest rocket. But what type? South American forest rockets are recorded from the Middle Eocene, possibly to the early Pleistocene and included gracile to gigantic animals. For the Miocene, the critters with intermediate body mass of about 30 to 70 kilograms are Mesembryornis insertus, Mesembryornis milneed wardsi, Andalgalornis stuliti, and Pantagornis marshi. In particular, the body mass estimates that are closest to the producer of Rio Negrina Pozosaladensis are those of Mesembryornis milneed wardsi from the lower Pliocene, although this animal was also recorded in the late Miocene. The weight of Mesembryornis milneed wardsi was estimated at 53 to 66 kilograms. Forest rocket foot bones are not usually found complete, and most are represented by just bits and pieces of toes and claws. A nearly complete foot is only known for some forest rockets, like a member of the medium to small-bodied Mesembryornithinae group Solopterus colzicus and Paraphysornis brasiliensis. So the author team suspect the culprit is a medium to large-sized forest rocket, probably belonging to Mesembryornithinae, although no exact match with a known genus is yet possible. Now we know what type of big bird was making these footprints, but what do they tell us about the birds themselves? The innermost second toe leaves the least obvious impression, almost as though the toe itself was slightly raised as the animal walked. This sort of arrangement is similar to what is seen in today's ostriches, uh, but of course taken to the extreme as ostriches have lost their third toe and run around on enlarged footpads. The second toe of the first rockets was the shortest toe in the foot and was capped by the longest claw, which was usually also compressed from side to side and highly recurved. A raptor talon held off the ground to keep its sharpness for use as a switchblade or grappling hook if it should see any prey. It's no wonder the authors made a brief comparison between the Rio Negrina Pozosaladensis and footprints made by dromaeosaurs of the Cretaceous. 
These fossil trackways corroborate an hypothesis about how these birds held their killing claws, an hypothesis that has been around since the 1940s, and that was based solely on the general anatomy of the toes and toe claws, as well as comparison with the toes of the only living forest racket relatives, the Sarimas. You can even see the killer claws on this 1940 Field Museum mount of Andogalornis. I do so love seeing scientific stories come full circle like that, finally confirmed that the terror birds evolutionarily converged with the dromaeosaurs. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.